there was, there has been a conference in Christchurch over the last three days, attended by 1,500 policymakers, uh, local government politicians, uh, local government bureaucrats mostly actually, uh, and uh, also water consultants. Um, and the government has shown no sign, in fact, the Naya Mahuta has shown no sign of reneging or drawing back at all on Three Waters. Uh, they want to proceed as quickly as possible. The aim and intent, obviously, is to have the Water, entity bill, water Services Entities Bill, but also Three Waters, all the staff in place uh, by this time next year, so that anybody coming in can't undo it. Uh, far from backing off, it would seem that the government, in actual fact, have now, uh, as a result of Nanaya Mahuta's speech two days ago, uh, put the, f well, at least verbally, put the pedal to the metal. Uh, joining us to talk on this issue, but also to give us uh, some idea of what the future might look like, uh, should there be a change of government, is Simon Watts, the North Shore MP, and the National Party and Opposition Spokesperson on Three Waters and Local Government. Uh, good morning to you, Simon. Very good morning, Michael. Now, I've got that right, isn't it? You are Three Waters and Local Government. Have, is there a separate spokesmanship on that? No, the local government covers three waters, okay. also associate finance and associate infrastructure. Right. Okay, so you're going to be an important person. And if you, uh, if National win the next election, you've got a pretty good chance of ending up as a cabinet minister and being in charge of local government, Simon, one would presume. Um, now, let's just work on the theory that things are going to get worse in terms of the economy, uh, that the polling uh, can be relied upon, it's probably going to get worse for the government because governments lose election rather than oppositions win them. We both know that. Um, and you're elected. And that um, you have um, uh, a partner in, in the ACT Party. Um, they have uh, members sitting in presumably the cabinet as well uh, and in some of the caucus or select committees. And off we go. Three waters. Everybody's asking, the National Party saying they're opposed to it. What would happen the day after you get elected with Three Waters? Yeah, thanks, Michael. So, look, National have been very clear, uh, not just that we're opposed to this legislation, but uh, as soon as practical, once we're in government, that we will be repealing uh, the Water Services Entities Bill. That will immediately suspend the creation of these four mega water services entities, uh, and that will, in effect, uh, put us or leave us in the current state around... Uh, assets remaining in local ownership. We'll then subsequently uh, look to introduce legislation uh, which we believe will uh, address a number of the key issues that we have with water infrastructure in this country uh, and we'll look to do that uh, as, as soon as we can. Uh, we've actually got uh, a lot of that detailed policy work uh, already completed and I've just come out of another meeting this morning uh, working through some of that detail as well. Okay, so what you're actually trying to do is hit the ground running should you get elected on this issue because you're going to need to aren't you because this is a bit of a juggernaut uh people are, as i as i talk to you now people are being appointed to jobs within the three waters process they um uh, are moving local government officials out of their councils uh into the well and already into the new entities can i say as you probably know simon yeah does does that mean that your theory is that you'll just simply send all those staff back to their councils and they'll be employed by their councils? Absolutely, and they should know that based on what I've just said. Uh, we're working on the basis that we will be in government in 330 days, give or take, uh, and the work that we're doing every single day at the moment is making sure that we are ready to roll uh, on day one, uh, and that includes having uh, legislation drafted to repeal uh, and also legislation drafted or uh, key principles uh, ready to roll in terms of what our alternatives will be. Uh, and we are being very clear and concise with public and the community around what we plan to do in terms of our intent. Uh, and uh, on the basis we have mandate to do that, uh, then we will do that. Okay. Uh, so, look, this is critically important, uh, Moyle, and uh, this government is just not listening. They're ramming this through. Uh, uh, against what is significant opposition across this country. And, and at its basis, take politics aside, we don't believe that the mega entity model and co-governance uh, is going to be a sustainable fix for the issues we have with water infrastructure in this country. Mm, because there are, there are two or three issues, aren't there, with Three Waters. The first issue is, of course, 
that are stripping of assets away from councils and being given to these four new entities. But the second issue that has excited so much political comment is this co-governance issue. Simon, I've looked into the background of that. It, it seems to me that co-governance is something to do or is a concept that really has taken off as a result of the um, interpretation of New Zealand's commitment to the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights. Is, is that where you understand as well? Look, co-governance is a Labour Party term that they have been driving right from the start. The key issues that we see with Three Waters, on top of the fact that it's confiscation of local assets, secondly, is around co-governance. We think it's undemocratic. We believe that that model creates division uh, across our communities and across our country. Uh, and actually, irrespective of whether you're Māori or non-Māori, uh, we believe that the co-governance model actually means a loss of local voice. Now, Waikato and Bay of Plenty have 68 iwi or hapu and iwi uh, groups, and yet there's only going to be seven seats at that table under the government's model. Okay. Iwi and hapu are going to lose out through local voice because of this co-governance as well. Uh, this, is not go this, you know, this is not the way we need to manage uh, our country. Well, and which sort of raises the issue of Māori wards, which um, also has been something that this government has pushed uh, very strongly. And uh, we've just gone through, as you know, the local government elections. The final results are all now in, uh, and bar a few, um, I guess, um, uh, challenges um, or recounts, uh, the, the dust is settled. Uh, one of the things that strikes me, and I talked about it on the show last week, was I was looking at the turnout of those Māori wards across the country. And if that is Māori engagement, Māori wards haven't worked, have they? Look, it's an interesting uh, thing, because your point, you're, you're right. Uh, we've seen representation uh, drop. Uh, but look, at our position on this is, is that, you know, this is a decision that uh, local communities need to make. Uh, it is not for uh, central government to be, uh, you know, ramming this through. Uh, that is a community decision. But, but the reality of what we've seen of, as a result of these government changes is, is that actually representation has, changed, has reduced. Mm. Uh, and I think that comes back to conversations I'm having with, with iwi and, and hapu across the country, particularly in rural and provincial New Zealand. Um, they're really concerned. One, that this is creating division within their own communities, pitching Māori against non-Māori. Uh, and that's coming from Māori telling me that. And the other aspect is it actually, you know, the loss of local voice. And, and no matter who you are or where you are across this country, whatever community you're part of, um, that loss of local voice, that disconnection between the democratic process, uh, the, a government that's driving a centralisation at any cost, uh, I think is really um, creating a dangerous precedent in terms of, you know, uh, where we need to be as a country. And that's why a national league government are crystal clear around our intent around this. Uh, we do not and strongly oppose uh, that element uh, alongside other aspects, and that's why we will repeal it. And any alternative model that we introduce will have no co-governance of public services, and that's the bottom line. Well, that, does that mean that you'll go back to that provision that I think existed that Labor have taken out? which is that communities can, if they disagree with the decision of a local council on establishing a Māori ward, that they can ask for a referendum to be held on that issue. Yeah, so we uh, opposed that change in regards to the legislation model. Um, yeah, as I said, you know, communities uh, should have the choice in regards to how uh, that aspect of uh, their local democracy works. And we were very clear when that bill was in front of the House uh, that we opposed that aspect. So yes. Okay. So you'll go back to the what well, the previous status quo, if you like, would be you, the model you choose. Absolutely. And look at its heart. This is really an ideological difference between Labor and National. Labor believe in centralisation and one size fits fits big. You know, one size fits all. National believe that local communities should deal with local issues. Central government should get out of the way. We should provide support where where we add value. Uh, but at the end of the day, local communities should be able to look after themselves and make the decisions that is in their best interest. And I think, you know, voters are going to be very clear around the distinction between where we are on that and where Labor are. Um, I guess local government's always been very much the poor relation to government. And I, listen, don't take this the wrong way, Simon, but having been in Parliament, but also in local government, obviously, as well, um, it's always sort of seemed that it's been a long way down the pecking 
order as well. So you've got your education spokesman, your finance spokesman, your leader of the house, and, and it almost seems like customs and local governments right down there. Or what's the other one? Internal affairs is another. It's, it's not regarded particularly well, and you sort of give the number twenty or the twenty-one on your list, and and, and you know, and, and and don't take it too seriously. I imagine if you get elected, local government will actually assume a significant prominence because of all the change that you've got to unravel and then put in place some new model. Is that right? Michael, I think you can see, uh, particularly in the last 12 months, how much I've been up in the house asking questions of the minister in regards to the issues of local government. The landscape has changed. Uh, local government uh, and our local communities are key enablers and key mechanisms of delivery for change and improvement within this country. We've got a hell of a lot of issues on our plate. Uh, central government are not the answer to delivery of all of our solutions. We need local government as part of that vehicle to effect change. Uh, and Christopher Luxon uh, has been very clear with me that he expects me to make sure that local government are, are a key element of our delivery vehicle uh, for change in this country. Uh, and I think you're going to see a renewed reset of the relationship between central government and local government under a national-led government. Uh, trust has, has gone and deteriorated, particularly in the last five years. Uh, and, you know, that is in no one's interest in this country. Uh, we need to reset that relationship and start rebuilding this country and local government and local communities are going to be a major part of that under a national-led government. Mm. Uh, which sort of leads to the next part. I don't know if you're aware, I'm an elected, I've just been re-elected, regional councillor. And um, for all the changes that have been imposed upon territorial authorities, uh, regional councils have had a massive amount of reformatory work placed upon them. Has that escaped your attention or are you aware of that as well? Yeah, it definitely hasn't escaped my attention. Uh, there is, a, as you will be aware, significant reform agenda hitting uh, local government, and particularly regional uh, government that you're referring to uh, across the board. And the challenge really is, is well, what is the problem that we're trying to fix? Uh, and these guys seem to just be trying to reform and change everything, even where problems aren't, don't exist. We need to be targeted in terms of uh, the policy interventions that we undertake. We actually need to understand what the root causes of the problems are. And I tell you what, 90% of the problems in local government relate to funding and financing, uh, bottom line. Uh, we need to get those settings uh, are appropriate, and I've got a number of ideas around what we need to do in that space. Uh, and, you know, we need to get on and, and focus on where we're able to create value, right? I mean, you know, there's so much bureaucracy, and these guys, I tell you what they're good at, you know, hiring bureaucrats, creating bureaucracy. Um, you know, Three Waters is probably the poster child of, of how not to undertake reform. But at the end of the day, take politics aside, you know, it is water is such a critical element of, of New Zealand and our future growth and productivity. And, and, and it is just so frustrating that day after day after day, you talk about that conference they had this week with a multitude of bureaucrats down there singing Kumbaya. Uh, it, it is just uh, outrageous the amount of money that's being wasted. We need a, we need a reset uh, and we need to start to rebuild. And, and, you know, that day can't come soon enough. And that's the other issue, though, too, uh, are the bureaucrats. Um, because what I'm seeing also is, and I can I, can I just say it's made me very uncomfortable, but I know a lot of other people as well. Um, I'm thinking of the National Policy Statement on fresh water, for example, uh, that, that has come through, and the way it's been interpreted, so it's a bland statement of its own, but the way in which it's been interpreted by Ministry of Education bureaucrats, and that then is instructed to regional councils, and Simon, what I've noticed is that, um, and, and the way it's been interpreted is that uh, um, Maori interests or cultural interests and uh, ecological interests seem to be more important than the local economies that are sustained, for example, by um, waterways and irrigation and the likes uh, in many rural parts of New Zealand. Have you found that as you've been going around on your travels as well? Yeah, absolutely. And look, you know, first principles, the, the environmental aspects absolutely are important. But what you're seeing happen here is a top-down approach by uh, central government, 
ministers in particular, top down. We know best. Um, this is what how it needs to work. Uh, versus actually uh, how we see the world, which is actually you know we need to get out of the way and empower our local communities and local government to to deal with those issues. Because who's best placed to deal with the local environmental issues or discharge or whatever the thing is in a local community? Well, it's not some bureaucrat sitting in Wellington. You know, it is the communities that lie uh, in the areas that are impacted. And, the, and when I travel around the country, you know, I, there is no shortage of energy aspiration and appetite by local communities to just get on and do their own thing. What they are so frustrated about is government, every corner they go around to try and make change and improve their community, government are blocking them. Now, they're in their way and they're not adding value. They're not helping. They're blocking them. And there seems to be this top-down attitude that, you know, Wellington knows best. Well, I'm sorry, that is not the reality, uh, and we don't have all the answers. But I'll tell you what, that's why we need to work together, not against our local government in terms of what we need to do. Uh, because there's a huge amount of things that we can unlock in terms of economic growth, productivity and jobs in our, particularly provinces, regions and, and our cities, um, if we just work together. And that, that whole mindset needs to change. Um, and finally, the local body elections have been and gone. There's been a great deal of comment uh, in media and political circles about the turnout, uh, which has been generally uniformly down uh, throughout the country. Oh, gosh, I'm trying to average it out. Probably about 5 or 6% in most uh, areas, with some obvious exceptions. Um, is there any thoughts of changing that, or do you work on the theory that if you don't vote, you've chosen not to vote, those who do chose to vote uh, get to make the decisions. That's the way democracy works. Well, Michael, we're always looking at ways that we could improve our electoral system. But, you know, the reality of what we've seen really is a, a Prime Minister who's down in the polls, who's desperate and is now blaming low voter turnout on, on a swing to the right across local government. Well, I'm sorry, what that actually is showing is disillusionment by communities across this country with this government. Uh, and that's translated in the ballot box uh, there. Auckland voter turnout, slightly or if not on par with what it was at the pri previous election. Could we do more? Yes. But, you know, I think this is just political distraction by the left uh, around the fact that the government is, is desperate, they're in a corner, uh, and they need to, you know, blame someone else for their problems. And Gurav Sharma, uh, he resigned yesterday, a bit of a shock, I think, or the day before, a bit of a shock to the government. There's going to be a by-election in, what, Hamilton East, isn't it? Yes, that's old Tony Steele's seat. Um, David Bennett, was that his seat as well, Dave, the National Party? That, that's right, yep. Yeah. Um, the thing that I'm intrigued of is that the Prime Minister says, what a waste of money, it's going to cost a million dollars, blah, blah, blah. But um, were you under the impression that if Eagle won the Rongatai MP won the uh, Rongatai, uh, sorry, went into Meralty, there was going to be a by-election in Rongatai. Wasn't that the story? Yeah, sorry, actually, it was Tim McIndoe's seat, uh, not David Bennett. Oh, Tim McIndoe's, um, right. Of that, but, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, these guys are, are coming out with, oh, it's going to cost a lot of money and all of that, but, you know, they've got to just look in the in the rear vision mirror. That's exactly what would have happened. I mean, I'm not sure how they would have spun that that line. But I, irrespective, uh, you know, National are uh, super amped up. Uh, we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, we're going to go hard in terms of that uh, by-election. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're going to see uh, more of, of the solutions that we can bring to Kiwis, uh, you know, pretty rapidly. And, yeah, I'm looking forward to be part of it. Would you be picking that uh, the Labour might not even put up a candidate in the same way that... For, I, I gave the analogy of National not putting up a candidate against Winston Peters in the Tauranga by-election in 1992. Do you think that Labour could conceivably say, we, we, don't, we don't agree with spending this money, we're just not going to even put up a candidate? Or do you see them in actually having to do so? Well, obviously, you know, they've been caught uh, on the back foot around this over the last few days. That's pretty obvious, but... You know, in terms of democracy, Labor need to put up a candidate and, uh, you know, I don't have any reason to believe that they wouldn't do that. All right. Simon, thank you to talking for... I, I'm glad we had a long chat. We needed to clarify, and, and it's not a criticism, but can I make an observation, that um, we're not hearing enough perhaps from your leader, but on, on the sort of three waters strategy we're in, this is what we're going to do on day one to do with three waters. Um, 
I have a wife who's elected as a, uh, she's a district councillor, I'm a regional councillor. Um, we probably need to get that message a bit more effectively so that I guess staff and councillors and councils know around New Zealand that there is change coming from day one and don't automatically assume that the Water Services Entity Bill's passing through Parliament is a fait accompli. I think we need you to increase the volume, I guess, is the word. No, take that on board. Uh, we will, as I've said, we'll be repealing that uh, as soon as we're in government and we'll be rapidly looking to put in place the alternative models. So uh, take on board that. Thank you. Good on you. Thank you, Simon. Nice to talk to you today, and thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, that is Simon Watts, uh, the National North Shore MP, the opposition spokesperson on local government. Um, listen, local government, can I just tell it was it was always given to the person in caucus that, yeah, sort of had to feel that your award was somebody, get him into cabinet and sort of, he was number 20, or she was number 21, or something like that. But it was, you know, don't be risk. We could give them customs as well statistics you know the whole series of portfolios that if the prime minister called you into his office and said or she said um i'm going to offer you this portfolio and it was local government you knew that you just sort of won you were you were delighted to be a cabinet minister but thanks you know but that will change um no question all right, that will change. No question at all. If there is a change of government, local government, it'll probably be on the front bench.